going to speak to us today about something called the Toaster Project. And who would know that toasters could generate this much interest? <laughs> um, it looks like um, if any of you are here, it might have been because you uh, took a glance at Thomas's book entitled The Toaster Project. And I just want to read, without taking too much away, um, an excerpt from here because I think it, it gives you a sense of how pleasurable and fun it is to read this book. But it starts out by saying, as I sit writing in this cafe in London, everything I can see, except maybe some wooden <coughs> clothes and some wooden furniture, began life as a collection of rocks and sludge, buried in different parts of the world. It's not that this cafe has a geological theme or something. It's that the rocks and sludge have been transformed in some very extremely clever ways, becoming this laptop or the tasteful wood effect plastic drawing or that electric filter. And so obviously you can get a sense of, of, of the kind of light fun style of the book and the kind of adventurous trip that's going to occur here. There's one other part that I, I really enjoy as well, and it's, it's fairly short. Um, why a toaster? And you're going to explain that, right? Uh, maybe, yeah. I'll just, uh, I'll just do something quickly. Yeah. The toaster serves as a symbol, my figurehead, the stuff that we use, but is maybe unnecessary. But then again, it's quite nice to have. But we wouldn't really miss. But it's so relatively cheap and easy to get, that we might as well have one and throw it away when it gets dirty or gross or look old. So there's a little bit of philosophy in this book as well. And Thomas is a designer. He studied economics and biology, and interesting, <laughs> at University College in London, and then completed a postgraduate master's degree in design interaction, that sounds intriguing too, at the Royal College of Art, and that happened in 2009. So he's presented a four-part TV series for UK Channel 4, and he's a, a TED speaker as well, and he's exhibited his work internationally involving social trends and biotechnology, bicycles, and of course, toasting. So welcome to Ohio State University. Thank you for making it. Yeah, uh, cheers. This long trek. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks for inviting me, Marcus. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming along. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk about this project I did uh, when I was a design student. Um, I was. Uh, I remember sitting at my desk, um, and it was my second year. I had to come up with like a, a project, you know, the grand project to show at my uh, degree show, which was kind of nine months away. Um, and I remember kind of thinking, um, well, you know, obviously as a designer, or a design student anyway, you know, one of the requirements is to kind of make a chair, and I've made this kind of plywood chair. But I started thinking, well, you know, did I actually make this plywood chair? I mean, you know, I've sort of cut some plywood up and put it together, but, you know, I didn't actually make the plywood, and I didn't actually make the glue which kind of holds the layer of plywood together. Um, and then I started, you know, looking around and sort of, yeah, looking at the kind of laptop in front of me and sort of, uh, you know, the various other things in the room and just thinking, well, you know, who made these? You know, where did these come from? And then just sort of going further and just that sort of gestalt moment of realisation that, actually, you know, everything in this highly, highly complex object, you know, did, you know, it began life as just kind of mud or sludge or sort of rock, and then, you know, it's been dug up and then sort of processed, and then, uh, you know, somehow it's kind of, you know, become a laptop. Um, and so I started thinking, well, maybe I want to try and make something, you know, really make something. Will I actually be able to make something myself? Um, and then I guess, you know, this quote just kind of popped into my brain, and it's from uh, the fifth book in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy trilogy. And 
uh, by Douglas Adams, and it's kind of like a sort of science fiction um, book, which I hadn't read since I was, you know, a teenager. Um, and the sort of situation that this kind of passage describes is the hero of the book, who's called Arthur Dent, and just happens to be, you know, kind of 20-something guy from the south of England. Um, he sort of finds himself, uh, by various means, um, stranded on a planet on the other side of the universe. Uh, and this planet only, you know, is, has a population of uh, just kind of quite primitive tribes people. And so he's kind of crash landed there by himself and he's living amongst these villagers. And, you know, he kind of assumes, and I think quite naturally assumes, that, you know, he'll be able to sort of introduce these kind of primitive to, you know, wonderful new technology, which he's kind of, you know, remembers from his life on 20th century Earth. And, you know, he'll be able to kind of transform their primitive way of life and introduce them to the wonders of the modern world. And, um, yeah, after a few days of sort of attempting to, uh, to do this, uh, he realizes that actually, uh, you know, left to his own devices, uh, he, you know, couldn't fill the poster, uh, he could just about make a sandwich. Um, and in the book, uh, he does go on to make a sandwich uh, for himself <laughs> one day, and then the villagers see this thing which he's got in his hands, and they're just so astounded by this amazing new sort of eating technology that uh, they kind of promptly sort of elevate him to the role of high priest of sandwich making and sort of base their religion around him. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I guess uh, I was kind of arrogant and I thought, oh God, you know, Arthur Dent, he was, you know, a bit of a, a, bit of a loser. So um, I'm sure I, you know, quite intelligent guy, I, you know, with Wikipedia, uh, I should be able to make a toaster. Um, and so that's what I set out to do, to make a toaster starting from scratch, using only kind of the tools that would be available to sort of a pre-industrial uh, person living in a pre-industrial time. Um, but I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to make a toaster, I want to sort of um, find out what it is I'm making. So I went down the, down the road to Argos, which is our kind of version of Walmart, I suppose, um, and bought the cheapest toaster I could find because I, was, I thought, well, you know, the cheapest toaster, it should have the least number of parts and, you know, uh, kind of be the simplest to sort of reverse engineer. So I bought this thing for four pounds, which, uh, you know, it's about kind of the price of a beer, some, you know, in sort of um, medium fancy bar. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, took it home and took it apart and um, kind of inside this object, which cost four pounds, you know, if you really start taking everything apart, you know, you take the components off the circuit board, and then you start taking the components apart, you can get down to sort of 400 different individual pieces that have been kind of put together uh, to make this product whose kind of sole purpose is to make making a slice of toast marginally more convenient. Um, and then I started thinking, well, okay, so I'm going to have to make all these bits, and then, well, I need the materials to make them out of. Um, and go, what are these bits made of? And that actually posed uh, quite a metaphysical problem, um, because what is a material? You know, what's the definition of a material? Um, you know, steel, that's a material, but it's also, but it's kind of a mixture, you know, it's a mixture of elements, you know, uh, iron and carbon. Uh, so, you know, okay, so we'll count steel as a material, but what about the plastics? You know, what about the different colored plastics? Is the blue plastic a different material from the brown plastic? And actually, you know, for me, I'm not a material scientist. Um, it was sort of difficult just to, you know, work out, okay, well, that's steel because it's magnetic, but that looks like steel, but it's not magnetic. What is that material? Um, and I kind of really, you know, knew that I had um, 
well, I had nine months to do this, and I thought, uh, okay, well, I could either quit my degree and basically spend the rest of my life doing this, or I can kind of try and simplify and substitute. Um, and so I thought, okay, I think I can make a toaster out of five sort of key materials. And I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to call all the silvery metal, I'm going to call that steel. Uh, so I'm going to try and make it steel. Uh, and then the mica, which is that sort of cardboardy type stuff, which you know you often see heating elements wrapped around. It's a kind of great insulating uh, mineral. Um, I'm going to get mica, and then all the various different types of plastic. I'm just going to call them plastic uh, for the casing, and um, and then the kind of coppery, glassy stuff. I'm just going to call that copper. And then for the heating element, well, heating elements are made out of nickel and chromium. Uh, but I kind of didn't want to mess with chromium because it's sort of a bit poisonous. Um, but I discovered that you can also make a kind of good resistance wire if you mix nickel and copper. Um, so that's what I was kind of, you know, fairly arbitrary grouping. That, that's what I set out to do. So I began with steel, and down the road from the Royal College of Art is the Royal School of Mines. And um, I kind of went in there, and like at the reception, there's all these photos of people, and you know, all the professors, and um, and kind of what they do. And this, you know, basically, uh, kind of almost at random, and because he had a good sounding title, um, I decided to get in touch with uh, Professor Fillers and. He is the Rio Tinto Chair of Advanced Mineral Extraction at the Royal School of Mines. Um, and I thought, okay, well, he'll know how to make steel. So I basically went and knocked on his office door um, and said, hi, I'm Thomas, you know, I'm trying to, I'm from the art school up the road, I'm trying to make a toaster, and I need to make some steel. And uh, yeah, actually, he was, you know, very interested in the idea. Um, and <laughs> didn't just kind of say, okay, bye. Sort of slammed the door. Um, yeah, and you know, so I was chatting to him about it, and um, and kind of he basically confirmed my vague sort of rememberings from uh, you know my high school education that steel, well, it's a type of iron, or you know, uh, essentially, and you know, for iron, well, you need to get iron ore, so you're going to have to go and get some iron ore. Uh, and so I went back, looked up on the internet, the closest iron mine I could find to London which was um, in the forest of Dean, which is this forest on the border of Wales and England. Uh, and I phoned up, um, phoned up uh, this place, and I spoke to this guy, Ray, on the phone, and said, hi, my name's Thomas, I'm calling from the Royal College of Art, I'm trying to make a toaster, can I come up and get some iron ore? Um, and Ray, amazingly, said, uh, yeah, okay. Um, so, I went up there the next day, in fact, um, and uh, it, it was slightly embarrassing when I got there because um, it turns out that Ray had misheard me on the phone, and when I said, oh, I'm trying to make a toaster, Ray had heard that I was trying to make a poster, and um, kind of was just sort of expecting me to want to, you know, take some photos with a rock or something like that. Um, so I thought, you know, to be fair to Ray, it sort of sounded a bit more plausible coming from art school trying to make a poster. But um, yeah, so anyway, uh, I'll show you some video, but um, I'm going to have to do this. Suddenly something changed. Yeah. And destroyed all that. Yeah. That's all something. 
Um, yeah, so uh, obviously Ray's mine wasn't a working mine anymore, you know, they had to make way for Sands and Grotto. Um, so it was kind of like a, a tourist attraction. It had been a working mine, but it had closed, I think, sometime in the 70s. Um, and Ray had been a miner there. Um, but obviously the reason it is closed is because this kind of small scale operation, you know, miners with sort of uh, headlamps and stuff, uh, you know, it just can't compete with the vast scale of things, you know, the giant open pit mines, which uh, they have in Australia or Chile or actually here as well. Um, and yeah, and so Ray's comments about big business, uh, I. I, you know, I'm slightly conflicted about them because I sort of think you can maybe see that this is quite a romantic view of mining and, um, uh, and obviously I would say a business needs to be of a certain size if it's to produce kind of a chip fabrication plant or, or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, in any case, Ray still does do some mining at Clearwell, but just for, you know, iron ochre, um, to use in sort of paints and lipsticks and stuff. But um, he did give me uh, some iron ore from the mine, uh, which I dragged back to London on the train. Um, the, the wheel of the suitcase broke off very early in that trip. Um, and so I got back to London and took this to, to Professor Sillias and said, right, I've got my iron ore. How do I make it in steel? Uh, and Professor Sillians, I don't know, maybe he's, you know, he was busy or something, um, but he basically said, okay, what you should do, just go to the library, you know, you'll find the information there. So I went to the undergraduate library at Imperial College, where the Royal School of Mines is based, and I'm kind of looking through the, you know, principles of extractive metallurgy, uh, all these various textbooks, which I guess you guys are familiar with or will soon be becoming very familiar with, um, looking for that box which says, okay, this is how you make rock into metal. Step one. Um, <laughs> as you may know already, there is no box uh, which uh, says that, um, because obviously these books are written for people who are just about to go into industry and you know, operate these vast kind of uh, mining and uh, sort of uh, smelting operations. And so I ended up going to the History of Science Library um, and kind of looking further and, you know, looking in sort of books like this. This is called De Re Metallica, and it was the first book ever written in the Western sort of world, at least, um, on mining and metallurgy, and it's from the 1500s, and so it was originally written in Latin and translated by uh, Herbert Hoover before he was president. Um, and it's addressed to the most illustrious dukes of Saxony, and this is before Europe was Europe, before the United Kingdom even was united, and hundreds of years before the United States uh, were united, or states. Um, and uh, yeah. And I ended up kind of copying this wonderful woodcut diagram. Uh, and it sort of struck me that, you know, this sort of process of trying to do things on a small scale was going to mean that, you know, I would have to go sort of back in time for my information because, you know, the last time people were sort of smelting metal on the scale of a person was, you know, perhaps the 1500s. And even there, there's a few of them. Um, so that's what I tried to do. Instead of a bellows, I had a leaf blower. Um, So that's at the car park at the Royal Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and so after I don't know, sort of 
yeah, it went kind of late into the night. Um, yeah, I sort of, you know, used up all my coke and um, sort of was looking through the, basically the remains of my furnace because uh, I'd managed to melt my furnace in the process. <laughs> and um, I pulled out this and I thought, my God, I've done it. <laughs> you know, the rock, it, you know, it changed colour, it looks metallic now, it, this piece was extremely heavy, it was magnetic, and when I tasted it, it tasted metallic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I was overjoyed for kind of a few days, like, yes, you know, I'm a genius. Um, uh, however, I borrowed an anvil and um, took it home. I couldn't get it down the stairs into the garden, so I had to leave it sort of um, in the front garden. But, but when I tried to kind of start, you know, heating up and sort of um, forging this metal, uh, it would just shatter every time. Um, something had gone wrong, basically, and that was a crushing disappointment. Uh, because obviously, yeah, you know, I'd melted my furnace, I'd used up most of my ore, and also kind of doing a bit more research online, I realised that, well, I'd made loads of mistakes, but, um, but I realised that if I did the whole process again, went up to Clearwell, got some more ore, built another furnace, got the sign off from the health and safety guy at the college, um, there would be no kind of guarantee that I would uh, succeed. So. Um, I started thinking, okay, well, I just need to experiment a bit more. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to build another furnace. That's a real hassle. So, what's a kind of more convenient way of making things hot? Uh, you know, an oven. Well, okay, that makes things hot. Uh, but you know, a microwave. Microwaves are more convenient than ovens. And, um, and you know, a microwave. Well, it doesn't have a temperature gauge. It's got a time gauge. So I went to my mum. online for um, industrial furnaces which use microwaves to smelt um, iron ore uh, because it turns out iron oxide is a fantastic absorber of microwaves and so by kind of insulating the whole thing with ceramic wool and giving it 30 minutes at full power uh, I was able to kind of smelt bits of my kind of ore and bits of my half finished ore uh, you know into sort of iron which when I actually hit it on an anvil, it would squash. Um, so, yeah, so a few microwaves later. <laughs> sorry? Was there any coal? Yeah, there was, well, there was charcoal, there was carbon in there as well. I got some, like, carbon black or something. And, yeah, it was all very, like, being an alchemist. But, um, yeah, <laughs> bits I was getting were quite small. Uh, so, I moved on to copper. Um, and for copper, I found what was once the largest copper mine in the world on the Isle of Anglesey in the north of Wales and got in touch with um, a retired geology professor who agreed to take me down into the mine um, and let me have some water. Uh, Yeah, so the reason I'm getting water as opposed to rock um, from the mine is because, well, one, it's a kind of historical site because it's owned by the Marquis of Anglesey and it's kind of provided the copper which plated the bottoms of the um, ships of the British Empire and so on. Um, but also because copper, you know, water which is going to run through a uh, mine, you know, run, run through a mine. Uh, will actually start leaching out the metal from the surrounding rock, uh, partly due to this bacteria, uh, which they told me was called snotite. 
um, <laughs> seems apt. And, uh, and this bacteria actually it kind of metabolizes uh, sort of the, the rock and kind of excretes acid, which then kind of mixes with water and helps leach out more of the surrounding minerals. So you get these pools which have a kind of fairly high concentration of copper, but also all the other sort of um, you know, arsenic and uh, yeah, um, and sulfur in the form of sulfuric acid. Uh, and so uh, another example of this process is the Rio Tinto in Spain, um, which is this lovely red colour um, and is also sort of toxic to most forms of life, um, apart from extremophile bacteria. Um, and obviously it's the river which gives its name to the Rio Tinto Mining Corporation. Um, and actually, the, the biggest copper mine in the world now is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's called Chiquicamata in Chile. Um, and I superimposed it on a map of, uh, sort of uh, Ohio State. And I think actually it's testament to the size of Ohio State as opposed to the mine. Um, it's big. Uh, yeah, but anyway, so from the water that I got um, from the mine, I was able to electroplate out some copper, which I then cast in cuttlefish shells. And cuttlefish shell casting is a kind of ancient way of making jewellery uh, to make uh, the pins of my electric plug um, and then also a bit for the wires. Uh, the next material I was after was mica. <coughs> I went up to the highlands of Scotland. So that was Micah, which is lucky um, So I moved on to nickel, and uh, I was researching, researching, trying to find a nickel mine in the UK, and the only kind of lead I had was this mine which had long ago been plugged up with a massive plug of concrete. Um, so I started to look further afield, and uh, this is Norilsk in Siberia, and um, it was voted recently, well not voted, it was found to be, you know, uh, said to be one of the top ten most polluted places on the planet. Um, uh, and that's because of this uh, nickel mining and smelting operation which has been going on there, uh, you know, for ages. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and yeah, although it was kind of tempting, um, it would have been amazing. Uh, well, one, uh, I don't think my student loans would stretch to um, chartering a plane to take me to Norilsk, and two, uh, I would probably be arrested by the sort of Russian police because it's a closed city to foreigners. Um, the other option was uh, this place called Paja Valta, and this is in the north of Finland, um, and the kind of uh, process they use in this in Hajavelta to extract the nickel, uh, it's called bio-heat leaching, and they actually use uh, some of the, you know, the bacteria which I sort of saw in the copper mine to 
know, leach out uh, the nickel from uh, the ore. Um, and Harja Belta has been studied as an example of an industrial ecosystem. And the idea is that the kind of the waste from one process kind of becomes the input to another process. And, um, and so, uh, you know, you combine different processes cleverly, you can kind of minimize um, the environmental impact of uh, extracting nickel and producing various other things. Um, but again, I was, well, I was kind of running out of time uh, on my degree, running out of money. Uh, so I sort of found that Canada had issued a set of commemorative coins in 1999, which were made of sort of 99% nickel. Um, and there happened to be a set of 11 of them on eBay. Um, and although uh, it's illegal to melt down Canadian currency, uh, it was kind of tempting. So I melted down a couple of coins um, and, you know, alloyed it with some copper um, and then put the resulting slug through the wire making machine in the jewellery department at college um, to make a kind of quite ropey sort of a wire. Um, which I could hopefully use for my heating element. Um, the, the final material I needed to get was plastic, and plastic uh, comes from oil. Uh, so I phoned up BP and eventually got through to someone in the sort of PR office, uh, and this is before the Deepwater Horizon disaster. So uh, I was speaking to this guy, Robert, trying to convince him that it would be fantastic PR for BP if they would put me on a helicopter, fly me to an oil rig in the North Sea and let me get a jug of oil uh, from the source, which I could then uh, use to make plastic. Um, Robert didn't see it that way um, <laughs> and, uh, and kind of eventually sort of ended the conversation by saying, look, if you wanted a tanker full, uh, it would be easier for, for me to sort of help you. Um, yeah, well, I had visions of a tanker sort of crude oil going into my lungs, but uh, in the end I decided to look at other ways of making plastic, and you can make plastic from various uh, sort of other feedstocks, bioplastics, and one of them uh, is a start, you know, it's, well, you can make plastic from starch, and so I got some potatoes um, and sort of blended them up. Uh, and sort of separated out this kind of starchy flour and then mixed up this, um, mixed it up with some vinegar uh, in this big pot and then tipped the sort of resin um, onto this mould that I was going to use to make my plastic case. And for a while that was looking pretty good, um, but you have to leave this stuff to dry. And I left mine to dry outside and came back the next day and the whole kind of plastic case had kind of cracked as it had dried over the mould because it shrinks. And there were kind of snails around the outside, sort of eating sort of unhydrolyzed potato. Um, and I was kind of getting desperate, basically, um, because you know my toaster needed a plastic case, you know, a plastic case, smooth plastic case to sort of hide the mass of components inside, like the defining feature of cheap consumer electrical goods. Um, and I thought, okay, well, how am I going to make plastic? Well, you know, I've kind of mined some, you know, some ancient rock, and I've heard that there's sort of this debate raging among geologists over whether to christen a new geological epoch called the Anthropocene. And the reason, you know, that this epoch would start now and that's quite a big deal because, you know, a geological epoch, you know, generally about 10,000 or a few million years. Uh, so starting one now, you need a good reason. And the reason they're considering it is because geologists of the far future, without any knowledge of our civilization, if it all completely turned to dust, they'd still be able to determine that something had happened now just by looking at the strata of rock because, you know, this... The, you know, the layers that, we're kind of, that are being laid down now, well, they've kind of suddenly they've become sort of radioactive again. Um, 
and also there'd be this kind of sixth great extinction event, you know, suddenly fossils would just kind of disappear from the fossil record. But also, you know, in ice cores and stuff, they find these sort of novel, um, you know, long chain polymers uh, of plastics. And so, kind of thinking a bit laterally, I thought, well, if I can sort of mine sort of ancient rock, which happens to be metal bearing, can I not just mine some very new sort of rock, uh, which happens to be plastic bearing, uh, from you know, one of the many kind of rich seams which seem to be dotted around uh, my home of New Cross, uh, just lying on the streets. Um, and so that's what I tried to do. I thought, like, okay, I'm just going to get some plastic and recycle it. Um, but before I did that, I went up to Manchester uh, to talk to a plastics recycling uh, firm, and I spoke to this guy, Keith, who's the managing director of a place called Axiom Recycling, and they deal with sort of e-waste, um, the sort of bags of kind of plastic cases and stuff, and you know all the all these kind of things. Um, and uh, we sort of got into a conversation about the WEED, which is the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment Directive, uh, which was kind of brought into force in Europe to sort of deal with the fastest growing waste stream, which is uh, electronic waste. Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, as a designer, I was kind of interested in, you know, reuse and sort of upcycling and so on. And so I kind of watched the passage of this legislation, but. Um, yeah, Keith wasn't very impressed with it, so I'll show you that. There's my finished poster. <laughs> and uh, there it is without its plastic case. And there it is on the shelves. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so as you can see, the price is £1,187.54. Um, yeah, uh, and so, yeah, so obviously, um, there's kind of quite a big, um, well, you know, there's economies of scale uh, which were sorely lacking um, in my poster making process. Um, but I suppose 
you know, with the project, I kind of wanted to sort of start, you know, investigating the value of things, I suppose, and, you know, how can this poster which I bought for sort of four pounds and it has so many bits in it and so many materials, how can that possibly sort of exist? Um, and, you know, on the other side of things, I guess I wanted to, yeah, sort of start thinking about, well, yeah, you know, a poster, it's nice to have, um, but is it necessary? Well, kind of, I don't know, uh, it might make things marginally quicker in the morning and that might lead to people like Professor Billy of, you know, getting to work on time and, you know, and then lead to a bit of slack in society for people like me to spend nine months, you know, doing, you know, sort of <laughs> crazy projects. So, um, yeah, okay, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions? <laughs>
Yeah. We create a civilization in some way. The information is all very distributed. <coughs> yeah, I mean, um, it's, you know, since doing the project, I have been contacted by a few kind of survivalists who sort of see the project as this great, you know, I don't know, uh, comment on their sort of maybe expectations you know, similar to Ray's, you know, the end of the world kind of thing. Uh, I see it as, yeah, completely the opposite. There's no way, uh, you know, there's would be a way of kind of, you know, rebuilding civilization. There's just so much kind of embodied energy and knowledge in the sort of cultures and systems that, you know, the only way to rebuild civilization is kind of, yeah, rebuild civilization over however many thousands of years. And uh, Professor Silly has made the point that uh, you couldn't go through, you know, the sort of uh, Bronze Age again uh, in the same way because the copper ores that uh, we're kind of extracting nowadays, they just have a kind of fraction of a percent of copper in them, uh, you know, whereas the copper ores that were being extracted first, you know, uh, in the Bronze Age were kind of high grade. Um, and so, you know, but obviously we'd have like tons of copper in everything anyway. So yeah, so it's kind of an interesting question. I mean, I suppose what I really kind of got out of it was just how insanely kind of complex and sort of interdependent the entire world is now. And yeah, and I don't see that particularly as a problem. I don't know, uh, maybe it's slightly brittle. Um, uh, I mean, I suppose I've always been quite sort of like hesitant to buy things. I mean, I, God, I think I'm going to give quite a pessimistic answer in that um, I don't think it's made me more, you know, I think just the sort of I get, you know, maybe it's just like we all go through kind of cycles of like being kind of optimistic and, you know, sort of restraining ourselves and then kind of thinking, oh, drop in the ocean kind of thing. And, you know, I kind of suppose I fluctuate between that. Um, I've certainly done a bit more flying since <laughs> this project has uh, come out because I keep on getting hard to turn down invitations to sort of come and speak at places. So, um, yeah, uh, I could show you this picture. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is a picture of my dad um, holding a toilet brush. Uh, and I asked him to email me this picture uh, because I suddenly, you know, this, he, the, the toilet brush <coughs> is something he fixed about 10 years ago. And it's kind of remarkable to spend couple of hours or whatever it was, fixing a toilet brush. Um, you know, he kind of, the, the plastic handle snapped off, so he got like a, you know, metal bar and kind of put it in and then glued it all up. Uh, and I asked him why he would bother to spend time fixing this kind of worthless item. And he pointed out that he made this repair 10 years ago. Um, and the repair still stands. And in making a repair, you can quite often eliminate the original design flaw. So, you know, in making a repair, you're sort of, uh, you know, making it better than new. Um, so I guess, yeah, this is the sort of, yeah, family I came from. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I guess I've always been quite sort of into not accumulating too much stuff. But the flip side of that is we all told that, yeah, we need to buy more stuff because 
that will keep the economy growing. And so it seems like there's the prongs of the dilemma, and that's what I think the, you know, obviously it's a great challenge of finding the way you know, through this dilemma. And that's why I'm not particularly, you know, I'm not particularly sort of keen on this idea of that the way out is to go back to the woods and kind of make everything yourself and so on. You know, the way out is kind of forward and, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, working with industry and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the toaster is now... Um, I wanted to, yeah. So the poster is now here. Uh, it's in the Science Museum in London. Uh, I'm, so I couldn't kind of bring it. Um, and getting it through customs might have been difficult as well. <laughs> extremely fragile. Um, and so, yeah, so it's in the Science Museum, which is kind of crazy, uh, considering it's basically a collection of broken microwaves and pots and pans and stuff. And it's next to Stevenson's rocket which is this kind of icon of the Industrial Revolution, what sort of made the Industrial Revolution happen in a way. Um, and also in the background there's a Bessemer converter, which is um, kind of what I needed to make my sort of lump of, um, you know, sort of the stuff I got out of the furnace into, into steel. Uh, so yeah, so that's, that's quite nice. <laughs> Yeah, quite a good for that project. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much time we've got, but uh, maybe another question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Well, you know, to make a movement in the States is to, yeah. you know, it's kind of spread it, you know, it's kind of happening everywhere, I think, and that's quite interesting, and 3D printing and so on, and, um, and so perhaps that's the kind of way of making stuff, because if you make it, you kind of value it a bit more, and, you know, if people start making, like, craft toasters, then, you know, you're not going to chuck away a craft toaster, and so I, I don't know why craft objects tend to be, like, chairs and lamps and vases, you know, it'd be great if craft people would start making, you know, attacking the territory of, like, consumer goods, but, uh, yeah, we'll see, yeah. Well, thank you very much for your
Ohio Stadium. It has absolutely no functionality whatsoever. <laughs> 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 <laughs>